1912, John McCormick teamed up with the concert agent Charles L. Wagner, and from his association with Wagner dates McCormick's meteoric rise to fame. By the middle war years, he could fill virtually any auditorium in any part of the United States, north or south, to overcapacity. He sang in New York as many as 12 times in a single season. In Boston, it was four times in a week. Through nearly three decades, McCormick had Teddy Schneider as his faithful accompanist. His fame in this country was just astonishing. I try to explain it to some of my students at Juilliard that it would be a, a combination of having the fame of a Pavarotti, a Madonna, and uh, Johnny Carson or something rolled into one. He covered all aspects, I think, of society. In one season in New York alone, where normally, even today, a great international artist would give one concert, he gave six or seven or eight concerts to huge audiences. He was a phenomenon. With the advent of radio as a mass medium in the 20s, McCormick became a radio celebrity, reaching millions who never had the chance to hear him in opera or in the concert hall. After thinking it over, Big, it's no use. What's no use? No use changing your name to Bambino Gravoli. Bambino <laughs> Gravoli on the front of the Metropolitan Opera House today wouldn't draw flies. But the name, Bing Cross? Oh, that'd draw some flies. <laughs> I have a letter here, and I'll just read you a little bit out of it to tell you how much Bing Crosby thought of John McCormack. It's an interesting thing to note that though John McCormack has been gone for some years now, no one has ever risen in the field who even gave evidence that he could begin to take his place. Of course, no one will ever take his place with me. There was only one tenor who had the same kind of celebrity as McCormack, and that was the operatic colossus Enrico Caruso. McCormick would christen Caruso Il Re, the king. Caruso was his all-time idol from the very first time he saw him on stage. And I think one of his nice quotations when Caruso died was, Caruso made all us other singers look humble. McCormick was supposed to have been coming out of the lift, and there was Caruso in the foy, and uh, John's supposed to have said to him, you know, How's the greatest tenor in the world this morning? And Caruso laughed and says, Well, Matt, since when do you become a baritone? I suppose it's sort of it's typical of the kind of friendship and really amicable rivalry between them. Between the death of Enrico Caruso in 1921 and the rise of Crosby and Sinatra in the 1930s, John McCormack was the greatest celebrity in America the finest concert recitalist of his time, to whom the two terms, serious musician on the one hand and popular artist on the other, were as two sides of the same coin. The divergence of serious and popular music now makes his kind of career impossible. Even today, the spirit of McCormick lives on in America. In New York City, with a population of eight million, improbable chance encounters evoke memories of the tenor. What do you think the chances would be of taking a taxi in New York City and finding you were being driven by a McCormick? Not just any McCormick, but a relative of John McCormick. Isn't that right, Edward? That's right, Gordon. I don't know how many years ago, probably around the turn of the century, my grandfather came over from Westmeath, settled here in New York. And growing up, almost every Irish household in New York would have a John McCormick record and I have a few records myself and, and give them a spin now and then and uh, gets me uh... he, he gets you in the doesn't he? In the yes heart. he does yeah. yes he does I have lost in my friend. 